I wasn't born when Neil Armstrong went to the moon, but my parents were. And I remember them telling me the stories of how watching the moon landing made them feel. They were both in India at the time, watching on a small black and white television with a fuzzy screen. And they were one of 600 million people watching the moon landing. But the way they described it to me was as a very intimate moment. It was like they were actually there with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, like they were there in the lunar capsule, watching them, taking the first steps and speaking the first words on the moon. And they told me these stories when I was growing up, when I was your age, and I love space. I love everything to do with space. But when they told me these stories, um, I felt sad. And this was really strange because of how much I love space, but I felt sad. And it took me a long time to realize why I felt sad hearing these stories about these incredible space adventures. And it dawned on me that I felt sad because I realized that my life and my generation was so very, very far away from what was going on here. It was so inaccessible. I'll ask you, the most memorable space-related TV moment of my teenage years, do you know what it was? It was the, uh, the finale of Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm a Trekkie, I admit it. And, but what I felt growing up was that no one cared about space anymore. The Cold War was over, the political imperative was lost, government funding had dried up, and space had got boring. It was like the space science fiction had evolved to the next generation, but the space science fact had not. And this didn't go away. I went to university, I studied physics, and you'd think that there, more than anywhere else, I would have this wonderful opportunity to be involved in space, but it still felt inaccessible if I actually wanted to do that with my life. It still felt out of reach. And it seemed that at the time, the world was more interested in me becoming an accountant rather than an astronaut. So why am I telling you this, and why does this matter? Well, I believe it matters a great deal for many reasons, but there are two in particular that I'd like to highlight. The first is this. This is your physics textbook. I believe that when space became inaccessible, it had a direct and measurable impact on the number of you that were interested in studying physics at university. And I think the reason this happens is that physics as a subject is at its heart, it's about searching for the answers to the universe's most fundamental questions. And I don't believe there's any other field of human practical endeavor that comes closer to answering these questions than space exploration. And so when space became inaccessible, so did this for many people. Between 1990 and 2006, the number of British students studying physics at A-level halved. In the last 15 years, one in four British universities have stopped teaching physics. And I think this is very sad. I think it's a very big deal. The second impact I want to talk about is this. I believe, I have a theory, that the decline in space activity, the inaccessibility of space, over the last couple of decades has slowed down the pace of humanity's technological evolution. Now this may be a controversial thesis, especially seeing as I imagine most of you have phones in your pocket right now with more computing power than the Apollo 11 moon capsule. But my theory is this, the Apollo 11 mission program lasted for just nine years. And in that short time, it had more impact than any other technological achievement in history. So I asked myself, what would have happened if the Apollo program had not lasted for just nine years, but for 50 years? Imagine if it had continu continued at that same force, that same energy from my parents' generation to my generation to your generation. The answer is, I, I don't know exactly what would have happened, but I can imagine. And in my imagination, we could all be flying around on jetpacks. We could all have shiny armored suits. And we may all be taking holidays to Pandora. I don't know. But the point is the NASA scientists in the 60s didn't know either. There is no roadmap for this innovation. They had no idea that, um, that their achievements would one day lead to the creation of the first practical fuel cell or the first integrated circuit. It's very likely that the company I work for today may not exist if it hadn't been for the Apollo mission. There is no roadmap for this innovation. So, as a teenager, I felt sad because space, this thing I adored, felt so far away and so distant. And I really believed that other people were affected and this had a measurable impact on education and technological progress. But what about the future? 
Well, when I think about the future, I'm actually very hopeful. And I think there are three encouraging signs that I'd like to point to. The first is the fact that governments, for the first time in a long time, are starting to get excited by space again. And this is fantastic. Right here in Britain, we've never had our own space agency. We've never had a NASA, but we do now. This year, it was founded for the first time, the UK Space Agency. And this is fantastic. Across the Atlantic, Obama signed the Space Exploration Act earlier this year, which is going to lead to a manned mission to an asteroid by 2025, and a manned mission all the way to Mars sometime in the 2030s. And across the world, governments are starting to get excited about space again. Um, 10 years ago, there were only 40 government space agencies in the world. Today, there are 55. So this is fantastic. And governments are always going to have a central role in space exploration. The reason for this is that space is, at its heart, it's a public good, to use the term from economics. It's a public good, and therefore the public sector is always going to have a very important role. But that said, governments aren't the only game in town anymore. When my parents watched the moon landing, space exploration was exclusively a government affair, and that's not the case anymore. In the history of the world, 24 people have traveled to the moon, and I'm convinced, I'm convinced that the 25th person to travel to the moon is gonna be a private citizen on a mission organized by a private company. Private enterprises are also offering individuals to actually the opportunity to spend a week or two on board the International Space Station, circling the Earth 200 miles in the air, conducting science experiments, looking down on the Earth. And if you guys have got to spare $50 million, you can do that too. But I'm convinced that over the next few years, you're going to see technological evolution and revolution. You're going to see the design of new types of reusable spacecraft. And what this is going to mean is that means that space travel is become, going to become a lot more, less expensive. Costs are going to come down. And I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that in the next few years, traveling to space is going to be as easy, as much of a reality as hopping on a jumbo jet and flying to New York. It's going to be that easy. The third encouraging sign that I want to talk about is the fact that there are more opportunities now for regular people, just regular people, not governments, not billionaires, to actually get involved in space. This guy, his name is Rod. He's 51 and he's from Norfolk and he's chairman of something called the East Anglia Rocket Society or EARS as they like to call it. And in his spare time he launches ammonium perichlorite powered rockets at 250 miles an hour into space. When NASA sends a rocket into space, you know how much it costs? It's about 50 million quid. Rod does it for 300 300 pounds and some change, but he does have to avoid some obstacles. He has to look out for cyclists, Labradors, and the occasional sheep, I'm told. This is, um, this is a photo of the Earth taken from 100,000 feet up. And you may think this picture was taken by astronauts or someone on the International Space Station. It wasn't. It was taken by an iPhone sent into space on a balloon by a father and his seven-year-old son. This seven-year-old kid, in 24 hours, got to see a view of the Earth that it took the rest of humanity 7,000 years to see. iPhone strapped to a balloon. And when it came down to Earth, they actually used the GPS function on the iPhone to track it and then share the video with the world. It's been, been viewed by millions of people on YouTube, which is fantastic. OK, this is a really crazy example. The Russian Space Agency wanted to understand the long-term psychological and physiological effects of traveling to Mars. Traveling to Mars takes about a year and a half. So what do they do? They put an ad out in the paper asking for qualified volunteers to agree to be locked up on Earth in a mock spacecraft for 500 days. And these, these five individuals volunteered. And so they are now sitting in this, in this mock spacecraft on Earth. And they've agreed to be locked up for a year and a half um, because they wanted to experience, they want to be part of this space mission. I think they've got, I'm not sure, I think they've got like another 390 days to go, so I wish them good luck. So these are just a handful of cool examples, but the point they illustrate, I hope, is that space is becoming more accessible. I call it the democratization of space. 
aided by new forms of technology, aided by the internet, space is becoming more accessible to more people. Um, there's still a long way to go. If any of you are half as passionate about science and space as I am, you don't want to be sending a rocket into, rocket into space from Norfolk. You want to be sending a rocket into space from Cape Canaveral, Florida. You don't want to be sending an iPhone into space. You want to be sending yourself into space. You don't want to be pretending to go to Mars. You actually want to go to Mars. And so there's a long way to go. There's still a big gulf, in my opinion, between the real space stuff that's happening up there and what regular people can do. And this gulf, narrowing this gulf, is something that I'm incredibly passionate about and something that I think about all the time. And I'm convinced that my vision one day is that everyone, you, people in this auditorium, people around the world, are going to have the opportunity to actually be part of space, to design science experiments, for example, that could actually be carried out on board the International Space Station, or to even go into, your spa go into space yourself. So, wrapping up, when, I, when my parents tell me the stories now, when I think about that, I don't actually feel sad anymore. I don't feel sad. I feel actually quite hopeful. I feel hopeful that I know there are lots of you who are studying physics A-level. I know that there are wonderful physics teachers out there inspiring people to go on and study physics and be interested in space. But the final thought I'll leave you with is that the, the men and women that sent Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins to the moon in 1969, their average age was 28. And that's you in just over a decade. You are the next generation of physicists, chemists, biologists, meteorologists, cosmologists, astronauts, rocket scientists, computer science, scientists. You are the next generation. And I feel very hopeful. I feel very hopeful that space is going to be accessible. I feel that space is going to be there for you. There's going to be enough space for me. There's going to be enough space for you. There's going to be enough space for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.